Hi, and welcome back to the second part of the feature modeling lecture. We are now looking at how can we actually use these feature models that I've introduced in the first part and the configurations that they model. And specifically, we're looking at different representations of feature models and how they can be transformed. So let's get into it. First of all, let's do a quick recap of what we've already seen in the first part. We've seen that features can be modeled with natural language just by specifying them in human language and uh, their dependencies. Alternatively, we can also write them down as a kind of matrix, as a set of sets or a table maybe, um, as we have already seen for the database example. And we can also write them down using a graphical notation. We call that a feature model. But if we specifically refer to the graphical representation, we also call that a feature diagram, where we have a tree of features and their dependencies and also cross-tree constraints which model further dependencies that cannot be modeled within the tree. And on the right side, you can now see different representation of these feature models, for example, in form of uh, this graphical feature model or in form of ledger language or configuration maps and different kinds of concrete expressions like natural language, they can be uh, features and dependencies can be contained just in our heads, or we can write them down as kind of plain text. And for configuration matrices, we've seen tables and set notation. And we can also think about how can these feature model representations be translated into each other. For example, we could imagine a graphical feature model like this one and transform it into natural language by a simple algorithm that takes each feature and just list the feature and the child features and also what relationship they have. And some of these transformations can be like relatively easy to implement and to automate and others maybe not. And now if we see this picture, we can ask several questions. First of all, how can we express feature models textually? So we've all only seen a graphical representation, the feature diagram, but we could also ask how to put this into a text file to communicate it easily with others and edit it easily. And then we can also ask how can we get from a feature model to a configuration matrix or a configuration map, for example, to validate a given configuration and check whether it's correct and also get maybe all valid configurations automatically and efficiently also. And third, we can also logically take the step back and try to translate our thoughts into a feature diagram. And this is a little bit more complicated. It is semi-automatic. We're not talking about it here, but there's some interesting literature out there on that. So these are the problems we are looking in in a second. And yeah, let's dive right in with UVL, the Universal Variability Language. This is a textual language for modeling features and their dependencies. And it's pretty easy to understand if you just take a normal feature model, a feature diagram, and like rotate it so that it lays on the side. So the root is on the left and the leaves are on the right. And then you can just uh, take these features and put them into a tabulated uh, text format. So here above with the features, we have the feature tree of the feature model and below we have the cross tree constraints just as in a normal, normal feature diagram. And then we just list the root feature and its mandatory children, which may be API. And API is an OR group which has get, put and delete its features, just like here. And there are also, is also some special syntax to express things like abstract features, concrete features, and maybe also uh, advanced modeling constructs, for example, attributes. So each p feature might have some resource consumption, energy consumption, or some price or something like that. If you think of the, the waffle example where uh, uh, the sugar and cream and uh, cherries had each one like 50% price. But we can also think about cardinalities, uh, whether maybe a feature can appear, appear twice or thrice. If you think of a Subway sandwich, it might have extra cheese or extra extra cheese or something like that. Or also other kinds of cardinalities that you say, um, we don't want at least one feature of these three to be selected, but at least two. So there are also other interpretations of the, um, of the term cardinality. And you could also think about um, um, yeah, dividing up your feature model into several smaller models. For example, here the API subtree in a real 
database example, this would obviously be much larger if you think of SQL. It has thousands of thousands of commands, and if you want to make them all variable, it might be interesting to break up the feature model into different files. And these are all facilities that we are developing, developing in this UVL project. And um, yeah, so we have now added to this representation diagram the UVL language. And that's already nice. So we have a, a textual representation and now we have addressed most of the syntax of feature models. So we can write them down. However, still we want to understand the meaning, so the semantics of feature models. And for that, it's really nice to recap propositional formulas, so some concepts from logic, and use these to represent feature models. And for that, I'm going over a quick, quick recap. Um, so for propositional formulas, for feature models, we mostly just need variables. The variables are going to represent our features. So each variable stands for a feature. And sometimes we want to say that a feature should not be um, selected. So negation is useful for that. And also we want these kinds of operators for, for features. So sometimes two features have to be selected. So we take a conjunction of those features. So one feature and the other feature always take a disjunction, so feature phi or feature psi has to be selected. And what's also very interesting for features and package dependencies is that you say, if I select feature phi, then I want to select feature psi, but I don't care what uh, happens to feature psi if feature phi is not selected. And also sometimes you need that one feature is selected if and only if the other is selected. So these were the syntax, uh, the semantics, I. Uh, just told you. One thing that's really um, important to notice is that we have to take care of how we use parentheses with our formulas and usually we take these operator precedence semantics. So if we have a formula like this, um, transactions implies put or delete, we take the right associative um, way of parentheses and that means that if you choose transactions then either put or delete or maybe both have to be selected. This is an inclusive OR. Okay, so that was a quick recap. And now we are going to talk through the example, the configurable database, and try to represent it as a propositional formula. And afterwards, we can see what this is useful for. And we are going through it from the top, uh, starting with the root feature. The root feature is configurable database. And to write down the propositional formula of this feature model fm, let's call it phi of fm, we just say, okay, the configurable database, it's the base feature, it always has to be selected, as I explained in the first part of the lecture, and we just take that as a rule. And then we're gonna take another rule, and this will build up slowly, so we have a list of rules which is uh, yeah, joined with the conjunction operator. And uh, we can think about what is what about the API feature. The API feature is a mandatory feature. So if configdb is selected, API has also to be selected. But also remember that if a child feature is selected, it already has a dependency on its parent feature. So if API is selected, configdb also has to be selected. In other words, API needs configdb and configdb needs API. So we just use a by implication to encode that API if and only if configdb. And the next one is slightly easier, transactions. Transactions is an optional feature, so we don't care if it's selected when configdb is selected, but still, if we want to select transactions, we need the parent feature. So we just encode that as propositional logic. Transactions implies configurable database. The OS feature is again a mandatory feature, so we can proceed just like with the API feature. And then we still have the groups. So the or group, get or put or delete. It sounds like a lot like we need a disjunction and that's also true. We need this disjunction. So if we want to, so if we select API, we need to select at least one of these and we can use an inclusive or for that. And this is parenthesized to the left. So what I'm underlining right here, but also the other way around. If I want to select the get feature, I have to select the API feature. And this, this uh, is true for each of these features. So the uh, implication also must have to be a by implication. So the arrow also goes to the right. And for the OS feature, 
it sounds very similar. So it's it's very similar to the to the org group. We want that um, if I select Windows or Linux, OS has to be selected, and if OS is selected, Windows or Linux has to be selected. So we can also use a by implication. However, we still need to take care of this case that either Windows or Linux has to be selected, not both, and also not none. So the not none we already have with this constraint, but we still have to exclude that both are, um, are selected and we can do it, for example, like this. We just say it, it's not the case that Windows and Linux is selected. There are also obviously other ways to express this. So that was the feature tree encoded in logical constraints. There's one little part that's left to do. We just have to take care of the cross tree constraints below the diagram. We, did, um, we may not forget these because they're also important. For example, um, for the, the transactions that at least one kind of writing method in the database is needed. And we can just append these because they are already in propositional logic. And this is also the reason why these are encoded in propositional logic here, because it's just a very nice way and um, a natural way to express dependencies. Okay, this now is the finalized logical formula for this feature model. And we can do several things with this. The most basic application is to check whether a given configuration is actually valid. We already did this. We didn't do this in a very systematic way, just by argument, uh, argumenting and um, applying the, the informal semantics. And we can now try to apply this using the propositional formula. So let's consider the configuration configurable database, API, get, OS and Windows, so everything that's marked green here. And these are the selected features, and they are marked in green. And we also have marked in red the deselected features, which are put, delete, transactions, and Linux. And now we can have a look at the formula here. We just take the formula and copy it over, and I've just marked the features which are selected in green and those that are not selected, deselected in red. And now we can just take uh, every green feature and evaluate it uh, or replace it with true, which is uh, this symbol here, it looks like a T, and we replace each deselected feature with a false, which is upside down T, which means that this feature is not selected, it's a kind of false. This looks a little wide, but we can just apply the usual logical rules, which I showed before, to evaluate, for example, true is true, True if and only if true is also true. False implies true is true because everything follows from false and so on. And we can just try to simplify this and we get a lot of truths conjoined with a conjunction. And obviously this is in the end also true. So what did we get from this? Okay, we tried to evaluate this configuration with the feature model formula. And if we get true, this means the configuration is valid because the formula has been satisfied for this configuration or for this assignment. So um, this was the read-only database on Windows, if you remember, and we already said that this is a valid configuration. So this looks good. We can also do this with another configuration. So now the configuration has changed. I've only selected configurable database, API and get, and everything else is deselected. Again, we take the formula and mark all the features as selected or deselected with colors and can evaluate uh, or replace these, um, these letters with the respective true or false value. And if we select this, we notice the fourth conjunct is false. So let's look into it. The fourth conjunct, it's not this one. The second, this is the third. So this is the fourth conjunct. And uh, the left-hand side is false, the right-hand side is true, but it's an if and only if. So these sides are not the same and are not equal, and this constraint is not satisfied. If we look back to the formula, what was the fourth constraint? It was that OS has to be selected if and only if ConfigDB was selected. However, OS was not selected in this configuration, right? It was red. And this is also the same which I've showed in the first part. So this was a configuration which did not select any operating system and therefore violated the semantics of this alternative uh, or more, more specifically of this mandatory feature that OS has to be selected. 
So we now have a, a logical way of phrasing the validity of configurations, which is also pretty easy to implement in a computer algorithm, which we are now looking at. Um, so up until now, we've seen the example. And now I'm going to show you how step-by-step step you can take any feature model, at least uh, the feature models which we consider in this lecture, and translate them into a, a feature model formula into this phi of a feature model. Phi is the typical Greek letter used for, for, feature, uh, for formulas. The basic idea is very easy. We want to translate each tree constraint, and later we want to translate each cross tree constraint and then put them together. So first, we consider the tree constraints. And for the tree constraints, we just take every construct of feature models and translate it separately. So the first thing is the root feature, which is at the top of the feature model, and this is always required. So we will just put it into the formula as is. Root has to be selected. Okay, how do we translate optional features? Well, for optional features, we don't care about what happens if the parent is uh, selected, but we do care about what happens if the child is selected. If the child is selected, we have to, um, we have to select the parent feature. So for a child C and a parent P, these are suggestively named, C requires P. In this situation, we can see it. There's basically an implication from up to, uh, from bottom to up. Now, for mandatory features, this is very similar. It's basically an optional feature with the other direction added. So if I take the parent, I also have to select the child. So it's basically C implies P and P implies C. It's both ways around. And we can just uh, simplify this to C if and only if P, if we see this construct in a feature model. Now for the groups, it's uh, getting a little bit more complicated, but uh, still pretty easy. It's just uh, writing it up in formal, formal maths. Basically, an all group is just an optional feature. And if you take the parent feature, if you select at least one of the children feature here called CI, the ith child has to be selected. So uh, parent, child, uh, parent feature and children feature, and we take at least one of these. So um, this is a big disjunction, which numbers through all of the CIs, so C1 or C2 or C dot 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 or cn, if and only if the parent is selected. And as always, this one is parenthesized left. And then finally, we have to code the alternative group in some way. It's also somewhat similar as the or group, but we don't, uh, don't want at least one of the children, exactly one of the children. And this is easiest. Uh, so the easiest way to do this is also to encode this or constraint. And then also, in addition, um, enforce that no two, um, no two features can ever be selected together. So C1 and C2 cannot be selected together. C1 and C3 cannot be selected together. And we can express this by, um, by demanding that for any combination of I and J, where I and J are not equal, CI and CJ has to be excluded. Now we are almost done. We just have to take all of these constraints, which we got, and conjoin them together. So we make a big conjunction. We take the first tree constraint and the second and third and so on. And then we conjoin all of this stuff. So all of these tree constraints with the cross tree constraints, which we also um, have to conjoin. So we just take each tree constraint. Uh, uh, so the first tree constraint, the second and so on. And also the first cross tree constraint, the second and so on. Just like we did in the ex example before. And basically, this way we get a large set of rules which all have to be satisfied for a feature model to be valid, for a configuration to be valid in a feature model. Okay, so now we have a formula. Um, if you remember, for feature diagrams, we had uh, this distinction between we have a graphical representation of feature di uh, diagrams, which is nice for humans, and we also have the uh, written down way of a feature model. So this was the universal variability language, UVL. We might ask, is there something similar for formulas? So um, for, for a formula like this, which is pretty hard to understand and write down. And yes, there is. There is a normal form of logical formulas called the conjunctive normal form. And this is a very nice way of phrasing formulas and communicating them to others and 
using them for automated tooling, which we will look in a little mo moment later. And uh, maybe you've heard about this, I recap it shortly. So um, a conjunctive normal form is basically a conjunction, so an and of a disjunction of literals, also called clauses. And uh, a literal is a variable or is negation. So you have features or negated features. You take these features and build a big or of them, a big disjunction. And then you uh, take these disjunctions and make a conjunction out of them. It's just a, a very specific way of phrasing a logical formula. And each logical formula can be transformed into such a conjunctive normal form, which is logically equivalent. And what's also nice is it basically uh, amounts to a list of rules which all have to be satisfied for a configuration to be valid. And you can just check each rule to find out whether a configuration is valid, just as we did in the example before. And uh, it's pretty easy to translate any formula into conjunctive normal form. I just do it for a very small excerpt here, and we just apply typical laws of propositional logic. For example, this is a an excerpt of the model which I showed before and we want to bring this into conjunctive normal form. Conjunctive normal form only consists of conjunctions, disjunctions and negations so we have to get rid of these arrows of implications and by implications and we can do this with uh, these kind of identities. Yeah, If uh, phi implies psi then it's uh, equivalent to not phi or psi. You can look that up in any logic textbook. We can just do this. T implies C so um, transactions implies configurable database. We can also phrase this like such. And we can do this also for the other rules. Now we have to also translate, um, we have to push down these negations because we have a conjunction of disjunction of literals. So the literals have to be at the bottom of the syntax trees and we can just do this with the Morgan's law. So not phi and psi is the same as not phi or not psi. And we can, for example, um, apply this here in the last rule where uh, the negation was outside and now it's inside. And the last rule which we have to apply is distributivity. You know this from math class, uh, multiplying out factors, phi and psi or chi is the same as just multiplying out these terms. And we can also do this here. I won't go into the detail, but in the final example here now, we have a conjunctive normal form. So on the top level, we have the conjunction, and on the next level, we have the disjunctions, and on the third level, we have the negations. And this is a pretty nice way of phrasing things. And uh, now moving on to the format, uh, the text format which I teased. It's specified by the Dimex Institute, and um, it's basically taking this kind of expression and assigning each feature or each variable a number, which is listed as comments above here. So the C has the number one, the transactions have the number two, and so on. And then we have a list specifying some information about the problem, so how many variables are there, how many clauses are there. So this is basically the set of rules, uh, the number of rules. And then we have the actual formula, and this is um, just taking the one for the C, and then a zero to uh, end the clause, and then going on to the next. And you can basically think about this as follows, that the zero means a conjunction, each minus means a negation, and each space you can read as an or. And this is really easy to, to write and also to pass. So this is the de facto industry standard for storing conjunctive normal form, and we will look into uh, what this uh, can actually do for us, not only for um, uh, sending logical formulas from A to B, but also for understanding what actually uh, valid configurations might be and how uh, for, autom for an automated analysis of features. Okay, to sum this whole up and bring it back together, we have seen several representations and transformations of feature models in this section of the lecture. Um, you already know about feature models, natural language, and the configuration map. Now, what we also got in, uh, in this lecture uh, in the past 10 minutes was the translation of feature models into logical formulas. And we've written them down using the normal math notation like A and B or C and parentheses and so on. And we've also learned how we can get rid of all of this notation 
also get rid of the parentheses by translating the formulas into conjunctive normal form, which we can put into the Dimex text format. And this is really nice for um, a succinct representation of feature models. Remember the, the configuration map, which was um, exploding in size, which was exponential. Um, the CNF is usually really, really small compared. So we cannot uh, express the configurations of, for example, the Linux kernel with a configuration map. It's just not possible. But with a CNF and Dimex, we need 20 megabytes or something like that. It's still large, but it's okay. And we've basically uh, addressed the, the first problem, how to express feature, feature models textually by introducing UVL, the universal variability language. We have learned how to validate configurations by just taking the feature model formula and evaluating it for the assignment that corresponds to the configuration we want to test. Now, the one question that is still a little bit open is how do we get from the conjunctive normal form to the configuration map? So how can we maybe derive all valid configurations for a given feature model? And we will learn about that in a minute in the third part of the lecture. And if you want to read up on the reverse direction, which is also really interesting and much harder because um, on the way down you lose structure and on the way back it's not so easy to, to um, regain the structure. So if you want to read up on that, here's some literature for that. So in this part you've learned that to understand large configuration spaces or maybe also small <laughs> configuration spaces, it's really nice to have a formal description, so a semantics of what your language can and cannot do, and also to have some representation which is communicatable easily and also machine readable. And propositional formulas are one typical method that uh, allows us to satisfy many needs for such a representation, maybe not all, because maybe it's not as readable as the feature diagram before, but um, we still have the feature diagram, we can still use it, but the propositional formula is also nice for, for automation. Okay, and uh, we have some paper recommendations for that, for example, for UVL and also whether real world feature models and uh, for feature models used in research are actually aligning with each other. Now, if you have the opportunity to do some practice, we would recommend something like this. Um, to really understand how these propositional formulas work and the translation thereof. Um, so just take this feature model and translate it into formula. Yeah, it's uh, just applying the algorithm that was explained before. And um, maybe if you want to get uh, extra uh, deep into the topic, you can also translate the formula then into a conjunctive normal form and uh, store it as a text file because it might be useful for something we do later. And of course, if you're in a group, you can al also check whether your colleagues did, uh, uh, did do the same or whether they came up with the same formula and also whether maybe several solutions for, for this feature model might exist or not. That's uh, also something that can be discussed. Until that, um, Thanks for listening and see you in the next lecture part.